Okay. So I suggest we start. Uh, thank you all for choosing the, the, this session and uh, thanks for the people in the room, but thank you to the audience on, on Zoom as well. I'm glad to see that there are people join, joining us online. Welcome to, uh, to everybody. We, we are uh, joining here the session towards ethical design and implementation of artificial intelligence in uh, peace building. Um, and I am, just to introduce myself first, and the pointer is not working, of course. Let's see. Okay, I'll have to, to use this one. So my name, sorry for the little technical difficulties. Um, for the people who are new today, uh, I'm Branka Panic and I'm founder and executive director of AI for Peace, Artificial Intelligence for Peace. Uh, we are an organization uh, that is working uh, at the intersection of uh, this umbrella term of AI or different technologies under this umbrella and peace building. Our vision is uh, a future in which AI benefits peace, security, and sustainable development, and where diverse uh, voices influence creation of AI and related technologies. Uh, and um, I'm joined here uh, by, by this amazing panel that I'm uh, really happy to work with, uh, Evelyn, Andra, uh, and Stefan. Uh, and you heard uh, them yesterday as well, so I invite this to be a sort of a conversation and maybe picking some of the points from uh, yesterday, and I think many of them were actually related to uh, ethics. So we will have a chance to do that. But I'll also first try before I invite them to start uh, uh, with their um, uh, uh, contributions. I just want to frame our conversations uh, today and to explain how did we come to, to this idea or, or now a project, it grew uh, in a project of actually developing a sort of a tool or guidelines that is specifically uh, related to AI technologies that are being utilized in um, uh, peace building. Um, and we, I, I don't think it's even necessary to conclude that AI is all the way around us, even in phones like, like this one. But uh, lately, in the previous uh, couple of years, when we started doing this work and we actually did a similar type of map mapping of the ecosystem of organizations that are using, uh, we, we did not call, call it AI at that point. We call it data-driven approaches to artificial intelligence, to peace building or to humanitarian action or international development. And we realized that there are more and more organizations that are utilizing these uh, technologies and then in similar uh, panels or, or in every single session that we basically participated in um, with similar actors like you people would ask these questions so obviously people started thinking how now the ethical questions come in place uh, in their work and they often had more questions than answers so as a sort of a follow-up of uh, this uh, 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 conversation, we decided to start uh, this project. And what you see now on the slide is basically something that I picked from the conversations yesterday, a sort of um, a wrap of some of the, not, not all of them are, are quotes, I have to say, I, I, some of them are just uh, something that I remembered. I can't say that they're exact quotes of the people that were talking about this, but Stefan raising this really important uh, question around the mapping that they did, uh, and what are now th those ethical challenges in publishing this information, or not publishing, or who is making this decision? Uh, are we uh, thinking about the risks, potential risks, especially having in mind that we are often working with organizations from conflict on, or fragile settings. Um, then what uh, um, Helena from Build Up mentioned, uh, the fact that in one of their projects, they're using WhatsApp because the local communities are using this. So it's a more natural way to actually use what already works. But then we simply start thinking about ethical implications of this. Do we work with Meta or Facebook applications? What are all of the implications of data security behind that? Um, uh, then, Evelyn, I will give you a, a chance. I, I think this is a super important point that you mentioned yesterday 
about human dignity as an unconditional baseline of doing, doing this peace tech related work. I think this dignity word is something that we never hear in, in ethics work, which I think is a crucial, crucial part to, or element of ethics work and what we need to think more as peace tech actors. Um, what Christine mentioned, the do no harm in, in her presentation of utilizing these technologies. Uh, how does this do no harm approach now changes, uh, having in mind this technological layer that they are bringing in, in their own uh, work. And those are just some quick um, theoretical frameworks that I wanted to go through quickly because I realized yesterday we had a lot of conversations, even now today in this wrap up, uh, like, what do we think actually about these terms, right, about peace tech, about AI for peace? Um, we actually think that AI for peace is a sort of a continuation of a peace tech work, or some would call this a digital peace building, as this nexus between the field of peace building and the digital technologies. And I believe that with every new uh, uh, round of technologies that come into place, even after AI, we will basically broaden this concept of peace tech technologies that we are using. And then we are bringing this question again, uh, what, what do we consider as AI? And I added this yesterday just as a sort of a reflection from some of the conversations. We don't even, we don't have this agreement. This, this is what makes our job super complicated. Uh, there is not a single agreed definition. People are still debating about what AI uh, uh, is. But we need to start with something, right? If you're developing guidelines, ethical guidelines, if you're developing the tools, we need to know what, what is our starting point and what we use, and we are open to conversation. We think this is something that the field has to agree as a whole. Uh, we use this definition of AI as the ability of a machine to perform cognitive functions we associate with human uh, minds, such as perceiving, reasoning, learning, and problem solving. And then again, it's not a single technology, right? And this is why it aligns so well with peace tech. It's actually, um, we call it an umbrella. And under this umbrella, there is a set of new technologies that are powered mostly with uh, uh, the big data uh, and can potentially contribute to some of the work that we are now doing in the peace building. And what we mean by that, and we can have this conversation as well, how the, the your lab basically decided to to define some of these concepts, we see this as a strategic activity that solidifies peace, avoids uh, violent conflict, uh, provides the tools for building something more than just the absence of war. So we are coming back to these definitions of positive and negative peace. Uh, and uh, the we, uh, AI is a tool, right, to, to strengthen capacities for conflict management and ultimately to lay the foundation for a sustainable peace. And this is just a quick overview because I realized not many of the examples that we heard yesterday actually covered uh, um, AI and we got this as sort of a, a prompt to think about from Helena um, that sometimes big data is not that big and I would like to challenge that uh, uh, conclusion because I think it's very dangerous as well for the work that we are doing and here there are some examples of this big data and algorithms that are being used that are definitely making some serious consequences for the peacefulness of our societies. And we heard it basically from Lisa and uh, um, uh, some other speakers yesterday. Uh, what are these examples when big social media are using algorithms in the back end of their platforms? to even create things in situations like the one in Myanmar for inciting violence or even ethnic cleansing uh, or the situation today in Ethiopia and many other. This is just a quick example, facial recognition, another one. Uh, Afghanistan, the latest example from last year uh, where we had the Taliban taking over uh, not only the territory but also all of the uh, uh, physical and uh, digital resources, including the big data resources that were developed for the different uh, services in Afghanistan that are now coming into the hands of Taliban. So those are all of the ethical layers, right, that we need to, to think about. Again, I don't want to, uh, to leave us with the notion that there are only negative examples of algorithms and AI, that we need to be careful of the, those malicious uses or unintended consequences. There are many positive examples 
um, uh, of organizations that are now utilizing AI like this one, not very far away from us now in, in Barcelona, uh, using the predictive modeling uh, conflict forecast to actually uh, predict the probability of conflict happening in uh, uh, around the world, utilizing natural language processing Oops, I actually love this one. I would not like to skip it because this is example. The previous one is helping mostly countries uh, to uh, uh, or policymakers to become more informed where conflict is happening. Hala system is actually example of peace builders themselves who are now utilizing the algorithms and the tool to send the direct warning of the populations themselves in Syria, utilizing the data from social media uh, to, to train the model and to recognize those instances uh, when uh, bombing attacks will happen in Syria and basically sending those early warning uh, to populations so they know when they need to go to the, uh, to the shelter. And it's not that we are searching. This is another thing that I would like us to, to be aware. It's not uh, that these examples are searching for high-tech solution. It's they were born from the fact that low-tech solution did not work. So the simple low-tech uh, warning system in Syria was not working. And this is how people from Syria actually uh, uh, created uh, this system. This is our, uh, our own example uh, when we were working the project with our, a local organization from Sri, Sri Lanka. So those are the peace builders uh, who were working with traditional tools uh, to uh, uh, um, work on the hate speech uh, detection in Sri Lanka. And we heard from Lisa yesterday how big of a problem this is becoming now with social media and because of the scale of the problem and the speed of sharing and resharing this information, it's becoming harder and harder for local peace builders to use the traditional tools to do this work. So they're looking for solutions in uh, uh, digital spaces, in artificial intelligence, in this case, to automate this detection of hate speech in Sri Lanka. Um, I know that we were already late, so I don't want to, to use a lot of time uh, for, there are many other examples, and I would like to invite everybody to see uh, some of the, uh, 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 basically, resources that we created just to put more uh, light to these examples, to positive examples, but again, with this notion of asking this question, as we start using more and more data science, as we start using AI uh, in, in our field, in the field of peace building, in the sustaining peace work, how do we ensure that ethical uh, work is being uh, done? And this is the, again, uh, just the proposal of the definition from Alan Turing Institute of how we define this AI ethics. Hopefully, Evelyn can help us a little bit with finding our way through this so we know what is this big picture, what we are starting uh, with, and then bringing this more from this uh, normative level to the actually practical level and practitioners. And um, uh, we, we did a series of almost 50 interviews now with practitioners from the field, asking them how they're actually, when they're doing data science project, how they're uh, thinking about ethics. And those are some of the uh, quotes from, uh, from their perception as ethics as a process, not a destination, or a place in their work to actually pause and ask some of the difficult questions. Uh, or op opportunity to think about unintended and unintended consequences. Uh, and I would like us also to, to discuss some of these issues and to think maybe do we have this gap and how to make this gap uh, smaller in between uh, the principles that we are putting when we are developing the guidelines and those practical things for data scientists to actually use in this work. I would like us to think in the other way around as well. Um, so what we as peace builders um, can bring to the field of AI, not only what we can bring from AI ethics to now peace tech and the projects that we are developing in this field. And this is one of the uh, areas of our research as well that we are doing this conflict sensitivity and, and do no harm uh, frameworks uh, that are traditionally used by uh, many actors in the peace building and humanitarian aid field. We are investigating now, are these tools applicable to AI projects uh, and working AI for peace work or what is needed to be done for these tools to be upgraded to the, so they are usable in so-called algo age. 
Um, is it ethical guidelines the solution? Uh, this is the question that I hope we will discuss as well. Andrea, do we need another guidelines? Uh, we will hear from you uh, all of the amazing work that was already done um, in, in this area. So this is, this is another discussion I hope we will have uh, together as a community of practice. And thanks so much for bearing with me with this a little bit longer intro, but hopefully this set the, the stage now for us to, um, to have this discussion. And I think we are a small group as well. I really hope this, we will have a set of in introductions uh, and interventions from uh, our speakers. I want to say guests, but actually you are hosts. <laughs> so it's, it's really great uh, to hear from your amazing expertise. Um, I, I suggest we start with Evelyn uh, and then Andrea and then Stefan. Um, and I will actually maybe ask the first question uh, to, to Evelyn. And we heard already yesterday uh, some of your work on, on ethics in ethics field, especially with this perspective of human, human rights and human rights is a minimum um, condition or, or request for doing some of these technologies. So maybe for the people who were not here, uh, or, uh, um, or maybe you want to go a little bit deeper into this uh, concept. Um, help us understand what this actually means, and then what is maybe the next step after the human rights minimum? That's even a better question, actually. <laughs> That's a better question, in fact. But um, no, thank you very much, Blanca for um, also giving this uh, overview for, of your work. And um, it really, um, it's really helpful also to, to see like how these um, concepts are developing, how even it was like peace tech and AI, how they're related to each other. It's not like exactly the same, but still it's related as you, as you nicely showed. And um, well, I'm a strong advocate for, for human rights. Yes, absolutely. Uh, one big reason is because um, from a well from an ethics point of view if you're discussing like um, not from nor because it's not descriptive like how or how we're doing things it's rather the normative side like the what it's a question about the what so if you ask what should we do what kind of guidelines should we have um, the main challenge there for ethics is that you need some kind of point of reference because um, at least if you're not fixing it on, on God or the Bible or like something um, like that you can kind of access, you need really good reasons. I mean, that's how ethics works. You have to kind of fix it on good reasons that rationally could be accepted by everybody from an equal point of view. So you need this good reasoning. And um, there it becomes tricky. Like on what do you fix ethics? Like what are possible point of references? And when we talk about peace, as I was discussing yesterday, and also when we discuss about human rights, they really share two basic values because at the end it all comes back to values if we talk about ethics. And um, they share two really basic values that are on the one hand freedom and on the other hand human dignity. And you find them both in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and you find them also, I mean, the whole UN Charter is built, about, is built around international peace. So, um, yeah, I think these two basic values, they, they share them. And that's why I would um, uh, think this, and these connections are also said yesterday, they're not by coincidence. It's historically and conceptually grew, grown after the Second World War, after this devastating experience. And um, I mean, something we also have to be aware of, off. We don't want a third world war to again find really good norms or good ethical guidelines that we could agree on. We don't want a third world war where AI will take over and then destroys everything and then we have this like political window of opportunity, so to say, to think about it again. And I think like from a realist point of view, I must add, it's, um, it's quite unlikely that we're going to find such good norms or guidelines to base it on again, because you also need a some kind of international agreement. It's not just enough that we're thinking, here the political scientists come in. <laughs> it's it's enough, just enough to say we want to do that. We also have to get it through. And there you really have the advantage with human rights that they're already, you have already the agreement. You have like international treaties. You have the mechanisms, the monitoring mechanisms. And they're, OK, they're not always implemented, but the validity is usually recognized. Because even when they are harmed, 
um, governments would usually not argue human rights, we don't care about them. They would rather argue, um, well, they were or we tried to do our best, but then this and this and that, which confirms actually their validity. So um, I think it's a really good starting point. And that, I like the other question more like in the sense of if we would, or maybe I can start from another thing, like what I've been thinking sometimes, if human rights as a minimum um, baseline, if it would be really implemented, would we need something more? like to turn it around a bit, or would that already be enough? Mm -hmm. Because it's really a comprehensive kind of list, in a sense. It um, includes both the civil and political rights, which um, are the negative freedoms, but it also includes the positive freedoms, which are the development, the sustainability. So yeah, as provocatively, why do we have um, all these other ethical guidelines? Why can we just not base it on human rights? Or what is the additional value of it? And Particularly also, I sometimes have the impression, but it's open to discussion, um, like that lots of private companies, they would prefer other ethical guidelines because for the first, they can participate in that, which is good for ownership, of course. But also, you, if we, there's a lot of lobby activities, again, from a real, real point of view. And um, secondly, I mean, human rights are not only moral norms, they're also legal norms. So means, um, it's not only we should be doing that, but you can actually kind of really get them enforced if you want to. So, yeah, asking a bit provocatively to everybody, like, why don't you make sure that the enforcement mechanisms are improved for human rights? And then maybe we would not need to discuss so much about other ethical guidelines. And if I may, um, you had that one uh, slide, just as a short, about the defini of, definition of AI ethics. Can I see that again? Because something called my attention there, as a matter of fact. Um, yeah, that one. No, before that. Mm, no, There's a before that, of, yes. Of AI. Where was it? Or even before, I think. Yeah. Um, it was about where you said that it's a widely accepted. Um, Somewhere you had that. Oh, no. the definition of AI? Yeah, yeah. no, of the, something that. Yeah. Da, 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 da. No, wasn't this, this one? The definition of it, the proposed yeah. definition. <laughs> no, it was where? Because I have taken. No, yes. Anyway, I mean, I can't say it anyway. So, because somewhere you said that it's like widely accepted uh, norms or something, which is around ethics. And I disagree a bit on that because, um, I mean, that's a classical argument with democracy also. The majority is not always right. I agree with that. And um, actually, what is ethical or not does not depend on whether it's accepted or if it's not accepted. Whether the majority is in favor. Yes, it's, that's a political question. It's not an ethical question what the majority thinks or if people accept it or not. Wasn't that the Evelyn? Wasn't that the case with the human rights framework as well? When when the now bring us back a yeah. little bit in history, like when the yeah. United Nations yeah. were starting. So it was the same situation, but then still the world agreed somehow with I the did. majority. Yes, I mean that's the ideal, of course. I mean that's the ideal if ethical norms overlap what is politically agreed, and then they turn legal norms. That that's the ideal picture. If ethical and legal, if the, like ethical is more about legitimacy, so if legitimacy and legality overlap, that's a perfect case. But it doesn't have to be that way. You have legal norms that are not legitimate, and you have like many ethical norms who are not like socially accepted. Yeah. So that's what I say. I think it's really important to have um, an ethical point of reference that is independent, like let's say, of political processes or even of social norms, because social norms that change during time, the change in the context, mm -hmm. and especially if we talk about something like AI uh, and risks, I mean, you don't know how it's going to be, I mean, how that's going to go on in a sense, you know, and if it's going to be appropriated by somebody or not. And like, um, maybe to add there also, I think a really important question is responsibility. And I mean, machines cannot take responsibility because from an ethical point of view, and also practical, I would say, um, they don't have the freedom. They don't have the freedom actually to make a decision. They're programmed. And you might have a certain autonomy there, but that autonomy is very limited because a machine can never be free. And so in that sense, from an ethical point of view, that discussion about responsibility actually 
doesn't make sense a lot. Mm. It doesn't really make sense because you are, only humans can be responsible. Machines cannot be responsible. So typically. So what would happen, for example, I mean, what do you want to destroy? You want to destroy the machine as a, as a sanction when, it's, when it was wrong? It's like, uh, yeah, it doesn't make sense simply. Which, which is basically the tough question that uh, Andrea is working on, because now we are, we are coming back from those normative uh, concepts and decisions of what ethical or moral is and what are the good and bad decisions to actually making sure that some of these things are regulated and they become the law or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and Andrea, I think, can be, bless you, our eyes and ears in the rooms that we are not present maybe when these discussions are being made and you have an amazing experience now with um, some of these processes of adopting or discussing even I think that's even more fascinating of actually having the discussion who is responsible and uh, 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 being uh, put in a position to agree on these kind of things and actually put this into guidelines. Mm -hmm. This will be my first part of the question and I'll add the one on now passing this from non obligatory guidelines to actually laws that for many of these okay. processes, I think still um, uh, we are waiting for them to happen. Thank you, Branka, and thanks, Evelyn. I think that's super interesting. And um, I'm, I will at some point show a couple of slides. Uh, but first of all, I wanted to just follow um, what you were just saying. By going back a few years, uh, when the European Parliament in 2017 came up with this resolution on civil law rules for robotics, in which basically was saying, yeah, can, can you hear me? Yeah, in which the European Parliament was basically saying, the smart autonomous robots are coming. We, we should give them electronic personality and thereby rights and duties. And the scientific community um, complained very vibrantly because indeed uh, at the state of advancement in which AI is and it's for the foreseeable future, there's no awareness or sense of purpose in AI systems. The decisions to design, deploy and use AI is essentially a human decision. And so it's humans and organizations of humans that need to be held accountable for the decision to deploy an AI system in a specific con uh, context with uh, specific safeguards that surround this. And thereby, a lot of the work on the ethics of AI has unfolded as uh, uh, really determining those conditions that are um, uh, surrounding conditions, contextual conditions, but also process related and outcome related conditions that uh, make the use of artificial intelligence responsible or trustworthy. Um, and that is um, something that uh, is reflected in the current work, for example, of the European Parliament on the Artificial Intelligence Act. Same institution five years down the road says a completely different thing, meaning that the primacy of humans over machines and the responsibility of humans for the use of machine is the only way to actually conceptualize a potential regulation on artificial intelligence. Now, who is responsible for the potential harm generated by an AI system is a very complex question because it depends very much on uh, whether the harm uh, depends on uh, uh, the original design of the AI system whether the harm depends on how the system was then trained, was put into service, was monitored, whether what kind of human oversight um, uh, has been, uh, uh, um, uh, um, say, added to the operation of the AI system, what kind of monitoring and evaluation of the work of the AI system has been uh, uh, um, basically contemplated by those that, uh, that, that use the AI system in practice, and thereby, and this is also even more complicated if you think that AI doesn't reach the market in the same way. And there are several different configurations of the AI value chain that you have to think of. So that and I recently published a paper on this, I can, I can circulate. Um, uh, we, we, together with the co-author, Alex Engler, we came out with seven different value chains of AI that all come with different legal ways of potentially apportioning liability and more generally outside of the legal space, attributing accountability for the behavior and the impact of an AI system. So I think that requires a clarification also in the space of human rights and peace. Uh, but over time, I think, especially at the EU level, I'm gonna show you a little bit what we did because it goes in some of the direction uh, of that uh, Evelyn, but also you, Branka, have mentioned. So I'm gonna sort of take over um, by, uh, sharing my screen 
and, uh, and, and show you because in 2018, when, the, when I was appointed uh, together with uh, other 51 people in, in the high level expert group on, on AI, um, we, that, we did actually, we, we received a mandate which was very um, uh, focused on ethics. In, uh, in a world that was already overpopulated with ethics guidelines, you know, the GPI with the partnership on AI was there, the Montreal Declaration in Canada was already there, the Asilomer principles for, for developers of AI were, were already there, several large tech corporations already had uh, over, overarching ethical principles for AI, even the European Commission had the first paper from the uh, European group, expert group on ethics of technologies that looked at the ethics of AI. So that was not really a big task, right? We just had to sort of somehow copy paste or think whether there would be anything that would be similar. But what we tried to do uh, with at least the core group that was more, let's say, independent and a bit more academic to some extent, um, we decided to transform this mandate to just build ethical principles into a broader mandate. First of all, to transform what is ethical into what is trustworthy. And so trustworthy AI became this tripartite uh, concept, which indeed echoes what Evelyn was saying before. Essentially, the first thing that trustworthy AI has to do is comply with the law. And the law will embed, especially at the EU level, a lot of the fundamental rights, um, uh, but it, it, the law would also incorporate enforcement mechanisms. And that is uh, what in the ethics space sometimes is called pre-compliance uh, um, uh, type of ethics. And uh, some of the ethicists in that group found a point of convergence there. And then there is the post-compliance ethics, if you wish, the other additional principles that responsible AI development has to abide by. And this will be then further um, uh, uh, developed in this slide. And this is what we then focused on even more in this uh, high-level expert group um, uh, ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI. But trustworthy AI, and this goes also to some of you, the question that you asked before, uh, but also some of the things that have been uh, mentioned yesterday, is also quintessentially a socio-technically robust artificial intelligence system, meaning in a, a system that, you know, the functioning of which is uh, adequately reliable and is not easily subject to attack and manipulation, because we could call this is not easily weaponized, if you wish, so that whatever, uh, however good the intentions are be, be behind that system, they are not transformed and, and, uh, and used against the original uh, purpose of that system. So this is what came to be, and it's still at the EU level, but also this um, definition became the basis for the OECD definition, then the G20 uh, uh, AI, the OECD AI principles for trustworthy AI, then the G20 principles from, from that initial work it spread into international organizations to some extent also Council of Europe has been uh, uh, doing this. Now, very, very briefly, then we started asking ourselves, what are those principles in the ethics within this broader framework? And the four that we thought would really represent all others and uh, would really, uh, if complied with, uh, proportionately, depending on the situation, would extend uh, to all other potential ethical principles that you can think of. Uh, are the respect for human autonomy, the prevention of harm, fairness, and that is both process and outcomes, and the explicability of the AI system itself. And again, to be uh, taken contextually, yeah, Elizabeth, I'm going to send them to you, don't worry. And, and uh, the, the, to be taken contextually, meaning not necessarily all AI systems have to be fully explainable, but in certain circumstances, especially when they're uh, citizen facing or, in, or person facing and potentially affect the, 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 the personal sphere of an individual uh, by taking or suggesting very vibrantly decision, they have to be explainable. So um, going back, we can get back to this if there are questions, obviously. But the thing that we did in addition was to start thinking on how the principles could be operationalized through requirements. And, and so the seven requirements that you see uh, on the right hand side are uh, seven requirements that if complied with would then lead towards compliance with those four principles that you see above. And these requirements are then the basis, although you will see that there is one that is not represented and it's the most important for us probably, one of the most, uh, not the most, but one of the most important for us, uh, for our purposes, that is not reflected in the proposed Artificial Intelligence Act with what, uh, a couple of caveats that I will add. Well, those seven requirements, human agency and oversight, technical robustness and safety, 
respect for privacy and um, uh, good sound data governance, transparency, uh, diversity, so uh, accounting for diversity and avoiding discrimination and uh, securing fairness, uh, promoting fairness in the process and outcomes. This is the one I'm, I was uh, ref referring to before. Societal and environmental well-being uh, was considered by us as a requirement of trustworthy AI, so orientation towards uh, societal and environmental well-being of the AI systems and accountability, which is then reflected in, in a legal concept of um, liability in many cases and however it's apportioned. These are the key requirements. Andrea, can I just quickly yeah. ask, because I think yeah, th this you can again bring the atmosphere from the room to us and help us understand when when you were discussing societal and envir environmental well-being is peace discussion present at all not a, well not really although not really. meaning we have to think about 52 people of which a subgroup of three actually discuss these things uh -huh. okay uh, three to five okay society and environmental well-being is implicitly incorporating uh, some of the elements of peace in the sense that we went to this discussion also yesterday that was a little bit my baby in this discussion because I was think I was I wanted to include the sustainable development goals in the uh, uh, orientation of AI systems, obviously proportionately depending on context and so on. So it ended up being an orientation towards societal and environmental well-being. Um, there is here a coexistence of a, a sustainability framework, if you wish, from a social and environmental perspective. It could also be applied to I don't know the condition of digital labor platform uh, workers. Um, uh, as opposed to the energy consumption of AI systems. But also, as you were saying, a strong human rights dimension that then overlaps quite a lot with the peace dimension in, in a number of circumstances. So um, I would say the peace dimension can be found in more than one of these seven requirements. Now, what we did after that, uh, because otherwise I take too, too long, but uh, was to convert that into a list of questions, uh, the assessment list for trustworthy AI, and then we, um, in, that was 2019, in 2020, we took that list and transformed it into a software, uh, a sort of a web-based platform, which was then released as, on GitHub as well as an open source platform that, you know, where, where you can, that you can use and customize, and perhaps it could be a starting point for customizing that list to reflect peace. Um, so that's uh, what, what I wanted to say about this process, and, and this is now the basis for the AI Act, meaning that some of these, these requirements are basic, the basis for deciding which regulatory remedies to impose in case an artificial intelligence system is designated as high risk. High risk being an artificial intelligence system that potentially uh, um, uh, can create significant damage for two types of risks, if you wish, two types of harm, fundamental rights on the one hand and safety and security on the others. Both relevant for the peace dimension. Now, um, this has become a sort of a blueprint for thinking about risk management evaluation and so imposing uh, and or recommending, depending on the legal system, that those that develop and deploy uh, AI systems uh, follow a number of steps and in a cyclical, cyclical way, because AI, the, the behavior of AI systems can change over time, right? Especially the uh, unsupervised uh, ones, but also any AI system that in interacts with the external environment can, can change its behavior over time. So we, we are in situation like this one, as I now have taken over the, the chairmanship and the co-chairmanship of the risk group of the OECD network of AI experts. We start this work now where we take uh, well-known risk management frameworks that are non-AI specific, such as the ISO 31000. We take the, the one that was developed in the US by NIST, you see here, Govern, measure, manage, map. So really identify the risk that a, that a, an AI system can generate, and continue to uh, um, test the system for potential risks and understanding what potential use cases might be uh, leading to which risks for a given AI system that has been developed or deployed on the ground. And then you have other frameworks like uh, the OECD is trying to build this work into the due diligence guidance for responsible business conduct, so that it becomes. Uh, embedded in business conduct as recommended and to some extent even if very loosely enforced uh, through the OECD due diligence guidance. But there's also the Council of Europe that has gone much more in the direction of uh, human rights, democracy and the rule of law with this assurance framework that you see at the bottom that includes uh, specific screens that do not necessarily refer explicitly to peace 
but they are broadly overlapping with this. And I think the Council of Europe would probably uh, um, be interested in potentially working on embedding more of that. So uh, let me just move to here, which is what we are trying to do now with the OECD process. You have the NIST framework, I showed you the ISO, then the Council of Europe, the EU AI, AI Act contains a sort of this principle for assessing conformity of AI systems with trustworthy AI principles and requirements, the due diligence guidance. The idea is to go in the, in the direction of a convergence between uh, uh, these phases of risk assessment. Not There will not be a full harmonization probably, but the idea is that building a body of knowledge on which risks should be controlled for, who should do that along the value chain, and how to do this and how often to redo it, this and under what conditions. Uh, this is something that is emerging in the AI space vibrantly. Now, footnote, because I don't want to take too much time, I already did. How, what can we put potentially do from a piece tech perspective? I don't necessarily think that there is a need to reinvent the whole thing, but to increase the salience of peace um, in the process of uh, designing, developing, uh, and basically building a sort of a peace orientation by design and by deployment, because many decisions are taken at the moment of deploying AI system, that is something that uh, is potentially highly needed. Exploring a little bit the space in between sustainability, um, the human rights dimension, and the peace dimension in, in more proactive terms, extremely important. Um, potentially advocating ways to stress test AI systems existing AI systems for their peace orientation or the risks that they, they, they incorporate, also potentially very useful and needed. And, um, but even more broadly from a, from a broader, say, societal and policy perspective, empowering civil society to look into AI systems and, and audit them for peace orientation, which is something that to some extent is happening for content moderation as a result of the EU Digital Services Act and will happen, I think, much more in the future as the role of civil society as a sort of an additional pillar of a, of a digital public space, if you wish, to look into the way in which uh, AI systems are being used and uh, detect situations in which there is a possibility that risks are created for peace writ large or writ small, and as uh, using the, the terminology that, um, uh, that was used in the topic mapping by Stefan and Uma and, and their colleagues. So I think all these things are potentially um, uh, streams of work that I would encourage uh, you to um, undertake. And I think that there is not a lot of work uh, going on in this specific um, field at the moment. Thank you so much, Andrea. Andrea basically summarized in, in 10 minutes uh, months and months and months of uh, research and reading that you saw like this field is incredibly big. There are so many things that have been done in the previous couple of years and now figuring out for peace builders, right, how to find our way through all of this amount of information that is out there. And there are two things and I really appreciate you pointed this out. So there is this notion of thinking about peace of any AI application and uh, consequences for peace, but also for us on a level of our own field, like how do we as peace builders actually ensure when we build some of these systems, what are the rules and principles that we need to uh, follow? Which now brings me uh, to our next speaker. Uh, and coming back to this question of who we are as well, um, maybe just a quick question for, for all of us to see who are the people in the room who are coming from Global South? Maybe you can raise your hands. And virtually maybe a thumb up, thumbs up if you, <laughs> if you are coming from Global South. So this is just, just an example to see. We are recognizing this. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, um, biases or blind spots. They, they happen. They're not intentional. They happen all the time. It's just important that we recognize them and then work with that as well. And, and I will connect uh, now, now this uh, recognition that we 
are representing only certain views in the room to the work that um, Stefan is doing that I have a, a huge respect for with this amazing uh, initiative that you started with these global perspectives on AI. And I think it fits well now to this amazing body of work that was done mostly in the global north, right? The OECD, well, maybe UNESCO, some of the work can be applied for countries in the, in the global south. But maybe you can, Stefan, share with us a little bit now what you what your experience is through this project about this incredible uh, group of people that you gather that share their own perspectives, including some of them of different even religious and moral notions or different traditions that they're building to, to this work now connecting to Evelyn's point of how much different we are in this sense and then which brings us back to the human rights as well, where we did agree what is the minimum that we agree with. Is this something that we are starting with in, in developing AI? And I think even AI ethics, when the conversation went into like different directions in this sense, uh, we realized that most of them are Western centric. Then we started bringing some of the non-Western perceptions to the conversation to at certain point acknowledge that human rights is the way to have this conversation. Where are we now? Help us understand, Stefan. Yeah, um, and again, I, mean, I might actually take the privilege what most uh, politicians take is actually not answering your questions, <laughs> but uh, give an answer that I would like to give. Uh, but uh, before I go there, um, I think, yeah, so the work that uh, you refer to is that a few, actually uh, two years ago, um, I became kind of concerned that most of the AI ethics conversations um, either are always focusing on one particular application, such as predictive policing, um, or are always uh, using frameworks that are originating in the well-established kind of, anyway, usual suspect uh, uh, corners. And so that's when I created uh, this um, uh, course, which is AI ethics global perspectives, uh, where, first of all, I wanted to lower the cost of actually having access to different perspectives, so the course is free. And, uh, and also, I wanted to make sure that, it's not, that it doesn't require you reading uh, a very academic paper. And so it's basically uh, video model, modules by people in the space. And so till date, we have now 50 uh, um, video modules uh, freely available uh, that try to explore global perspectives uh, that try to explore AI ethics from a, a global perspective, both sectoral perspectives, like what, is, what does AI have to do with dent dentistry, right? Uh, there's actually a lot of AI ethics involved in trying to secure that everyone has a beautiful smile, right? <laughs> uh, which is actually kind of quite often never uh, discussed, but I think that's an interesting element. Two, of course, different uh, um, uh, ideological and normative frameworks that can be applied, range it from you know, Ubuntu, what does Ubuntu mean, uh, if you actually have more of a collective perspective than an individual perspective to write, to, of course, you know, we have one module that focuses on the role of religion and what does uh, Judaism tell us about uh, AI ethics, uh, to you know, uh, Buddhist uh, and uh, Eastern uh, perspectives as well. So I'm not going to summarize all of those except for to say is that we just scratched the surface in those 50 uh, uh, um, um, free modules. Just to show is that this is a massive field that uh, we need a lot more intention in actually being more plural in how we go about AI ethics, right? And that it's not just about one application nor one um, belief set, but that we actually have, that we need to take the plurality of the world into account when we talk about AI ethics as well. Anyway, so that's my quick answer to, uh, to your question. But coming back to perhaps the global side, but also to perhaps um, give a different perspective, you asked for different perspectives on, uh, on AI ethics, is that I'm actually quite concerned with one particular aspect of ethics that never gets addressed when we talk about AI or when we talk about the use of tech for peace, which is the moral obligation or the ethical obligation to help out others if you can help out. Right? 
And that means that what I see happening in the space is that there are many actors that have data, many actors that have access to AI that could prevent conflict, but are never called upon because they don't do anything. So doing nothing is seen as ethical. And my view is that actually it is not ethical if you know that if you would use AI, right, in a responsible way, or you know that you have data that could in, ident identify conflict before it happens, and you don't share that data because of so-called ethical principles <laughs> that you don't want to do harm, I think that in itself is actually unethical. And I think we need to be a lot more uh, focused on um, what is the moral obligation to use technology for purposes that we know technology can be beneficial. Right? Now, to unpack that, that means that we, first of all, as a peace tech community, need to be far more pronounced with regard to what purposes do we want tech to be used for. I think the whole conversation of the last two days have been all about the, the supply of tech, not the demand for tech, right? And I think we need a lot more understanding what are the demand, what's the purpose for which, what's the demand for entry interventions that currently is ignored because we haven't figured out how to actually get that uh, going. And then the other element is then, of course, um, in order to understand what can tech do for those purposes, we need a lot more evidence on the value proposition of tech vis-a-vis -vis those purposes. A lot of the discussion here is based upon either an assumption that it is good or an assumption that it is bad. I would like to see some more evidence right, on the assumptions that it is good. I mean, yesterday, again, there's no shortage of stats about disinformation, right? I can show you many more stats on harm I would like to see stats on positive <laughs> uh, interventions as well, saying that we saved so many lives because we managed to actually unlock data so that we actually saw that migration patterns were increasing and that it led to conflict in Poland because we saw, anyway, we, we prevented conflict because we saw cross-border migration because we had access to cell phone data, for instance, right? And so, Basically, my argument, Ranka, is that we need to be more sophisticated, right? It's not just about preventing misuse, it's also about preventing misuses, because we don't have, um, um, we don't have the sophistication to think about what stands in the way to actually use AI more in a beneficial way. And coming to that, I think one of the reasons why we don't, uh, uh, why we quite often have those opportunity costs is because as a society we can't figure out how to deal with asymmetries in society as it relates to data and as it relates to technology. Meaning the, the increase in data right, has led to an increase in asymmetry between those, those that have data and those that need data. Right? And it's not matched because we haven't figured out how to unlock the data that is available to the ones that need data, for instance, the one in the field that seeks to establish peace. Right? And I think uh, overcoming data asymmetries, and I've written about that, is an ethical uh, um, quest. Uh, it's not just about preventing misuse, it's also about preventing misuses, because coming back to my first point, it is well established that there is a moral obligation to help if you can help when there is a clear need. Right? And I don't think we apply that enough in the technology space and the data space. So that's just my different perspective that I want to bring to the table here. I'm so grateful for this one, Stefan. I, I think it's, it's a super important one and brings us back to that point as well that we have a lot to learn from the peace building work as well, because this is actually one of the principles of the peace building work framed as this conflict sensitivity of making sure that we go when we go into conflict area and fragile or fragile country we don't only uh, make sure that we do no harm but we actually make sure that we contribute to to peace and peacefulness and sustaining yeah. peace and, and building peace and that anyway and do no harm i think anyway i've been in several 
situations where in my past life where again do no harm was a principle but there's a clear indication also that doing nothing is doing harm right and i think that's what my again my argument is is that in some cases we actually need to need we need more ai and more data uh, to prevent harm and we cannot just assume that anyway if it's responsible i.e you know, it, it prevents misuse that uh, we can declare victory. I think we need to be more sophisticated and understand when is doing nothing also harmful. Right? Perfect. Thanks so much, everybody, for sharing uh, your thoughts. I, I think we have so many insights that we can have hours and hours of conversation now going in different directions. But at this point, I will open uh, the conversation to, uh, to the audience, to you, uh, to not only ask questions, but actually bring your own experiences. I know that you are bringing uh, a lot of personal, either lived or worked experience to this work. Um, so feel free to intervene. Hi, I, I think the panel captured most of the nuanced discussions, you know, how to be inclusive, how to have a guideline, understanding that there are different priorities, different interpretation. And I, I find it is very, it's very difficult to talk about different culture or different, a different culture may approach ethics because there's an S in it, ethics. <laughs> and then we start calling something unethical deterministically, right? So, so um, if we look back in some historic example, like missionary, they think there's an obligation for them to help and the intention is good. But if you ask different people, the impact, some would say absolutely negative, you know, for centuries to come. So how can we reconcile the understanding that different people understand ethics differently, you know, and sometimes that understanding of different ethics may come into competition and some people think they're doing good and then the unintentional or maybe intentional consequences actually not perceived as good by the local community. So how, how, yeah, how, how to kind of go from there. But I think that one of the major questions I want to ask is, has there been more discussions about kind of the forward looking aspect because looking back into historic examples um, as some, one of the speakers has mentioned our social values actually changes most of the past global trade are considered absolutely illegal a violation against human rights unethical by almost you know any culture right so like the slave trade opium trade most of the trade were considered kind of almost technical for granted legitimate you know in the past has there been discussions about how can we kind of think about ai with learning from the past and then anticipating change in the future because in a hundred years time something that we take for granted as fully legitimate may be considered oh that actually caused a lot of negative impact If you have more questions, what we have is, is this, le this is not left from Lisa, okay, <laughs> go ahead. So, so do you want to collect more? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Very, very interesting points. Um, well, I, I, I was very impressed by the, also how, how you complemented each other here. And uh, so, so I, I feel that there's not so much to, to add. I've followed the debates on um, ethics of um, digital technologies and innovation in the field of humanitarian action for a while. Um, and there, there's this, there has been this evolution where there was, became a lot of focus on ethics because um, the sector became aware of how the data that they collect for good for really uh, saving people from death, you know, can eventually uh, put them at risk. Uh, and um, a lot of focus has been invested into ethical principles, ethical guidelines and so on. And now uh, there is, as far as I see, a growing frustration with the lack of legal regulation because the ethical guidance and so on has not really prevented 
uh, continuous problematic practices and the, and the organizations, they really struggle with this trade-off between, on the one hand, data protection and kind of a risk management, on the other, saving lives and helping people in desperate situations. So for them also, it would be easier to have certain clear legal standards that they just need to meet. Uh, and those that are bound by EU law and regulation and the coming AI Act and so on, they have that now, in a sense, right, when it comes to that part of it. Uh, so, and there's also this discussion on ethics washing as part of it. So I, I think you all took this into account in your presentations and talking about regulation is uh, uh, combined with ethics and the connection between law and ethics. I think you covered it very well. Uh, I wondered if, if you have an opinion on this UNESCO uh, document, uh, Ethics of um, AI of UNESCO, which is very broad. And where there, for instance, data protection is just one aspect of the broader setting because it's about how to use AI for really creating a better world and in line with all sorts of yeah, human rights Dignity, you know, all, uh, all the kind of legal and moral standards that are, are found in the UN, in the UN. But then the question is how to kind of translate that into concrete decisions when you make the trade-offs. On the other hand, uh, in the field of humanitarian action, you have the much more narrow ICRC handbook on data protection and humanitarian action, which is a, an example, I think, of how fruitful it can be to sometimes narrow it down to, for instance, then data protection, because it still covers a lot of different fields, but it can say very concrete things about how to do this or that when you share data across nations, you know, much more concrete. Okay, so uh, some weeks ago in Geneva Peace Week, we had a session on um, where I was part of a conversation on introducing ethics to the field of digital peace building. And there we uh, tried to draw on uh, three main approaches to ethics where regulation would be one of the three. So uh, drawing on the traditional distinction between deontology, consequentialism or utilitarianism and then uh, virtue ethics, uh, we um, kind of invited the discussion on the strengths and weaknesses of each of these approaches. One, the ontological about setting up certain general rules and guidelines. What can it actually do? What are the limitations? Secondly, a consequentialist discussion of cost and benefits in a very specific setting that the rules cannot actually uh, grasp, right? So some supported that approach and said, we, we don't want rules, we don't want laws, but others said the opposite. And then the third is about, okay, what are the virtues or the capacities that an individual needs in order to actually act in accordance with these rules or in accordance with these consequentialist principles? You know, uh, what, do you, what do both the, um, uh, actual kind of organizations, but also people who are affected by this, what do they need to actually know in terms of education and so on in order to, for instance, deal with questions of informed consent and so on. At present, it's not very clear exactly what those capacities and uh, need to be in order to practice this. So that's the third approach. So what's the kind of personal qualities that I need? Well, so that was a way of thinking about how this might be. These are in ethics typically put up as conflicting positions. In this field, I think it shows how complementary these three approaches can be when thinking about something like this. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Thanks so much. I, I will now return back to the to the panel. Whoever wants to to respond to either the more looking into historical uh, um, lessons. Thanks for sharing all of the points. So we do have another question online, but let's first. That's right, right. Do you know how much time we have? Or is there a survival question? Yes. We start later I guess. again. We start it later. Perhaps some of the questions will not be asked yet. Yes. But that's why I want maybe to respond to the first round of, yeah. 
we started half an hour late, but I doubt we'll, we will get the half an hour more for, yeah. <laughs> Stefan, would you like to? Yeah, just to respond, uh, um, anyway, on is, is it guidelines, is it principles, and, uh, and I think it's, it's, you know, it's all of the above, right? But um, uh, so we, we do a lot of work around data governance or anyway, setting up governance frameworks. And, uh, uh, and we always get asked, so what do you do and, and what are the elements? And basically, I've started uh, because I'm getting old and need uh, uh, mnemonics to remember what I'm talking about. So we basically have like five P's that uh, always need to be in place uh, in order to actually you know, be meaningful, especially when it comes to governance. And so that might be something that you structure your panel around. First of all, governance without a purpose right, is no governance from my point of view. right? And again, you always need to have a purpose. What are you governing for what, right? And I think uh, having more discussion about the purpose would already be beneficial because, uh, and I think the same with tech, this whole question of low tech, uh, high tech, same for it, what governance? Well, it depends on the purpose. You need a governance re regime that is fit for purpose, <laughs> not just because it's nice, right? And I think uh, that's the first P that you may want to discuss, what's the purpose? Then you do need some principles because that's your North Star, right? So because whenever you're gonna make decisions, you need for the purpose, you need to balance it with the principles. Then you need processes that, that uh, uh, are uh, in place in order to apply the principles for the purpose. Right? And then you need some practices uh, that embeds those uh, principles, such as code of, practice, code of conduct, or anyway, in the context of data, data sharing agreements, or licensing regimes, or anyway, other practices, tools that allows you to govern vis-a-vis -vis the principles that was decided uh, uh, to implement it vis-a-vis -vis the purpose. And then ultimately you need a profession, right? So you need new professional kind of actors to make it all work. And so those are the kind of five Ps you may want to use to you know, deconstruct your question, uh, because it's not just about guidelines, which is a practice, right? To implement the principles vis-a-vis -vis the purpose. Uh, but also who's going to do it, right? What's the profession, right? And so that might be something that you can uh, you know, use as a easy mnemonic <laughs> to, uh, to deconstruct. And that's basically governance, right? That's it. If I can just add, I, I really appreciate this level of, of individual or how do I actually do that now, even when I have the, per when I have the uh, clarity of what the purpose is and what the principles are, most of our conversations with, were with the practitioners and all of them are willing to actually know, to find out uh, what are the guidelines available for them, but they all struggle to figure out now, okay, how do I do that now? They don't, yes, they have data science capacity, but they don't have the capacity to know how to bring that to the practice. Uh, and and that the, the, uh, it's different across the sectors as well. It's very different in an organization uh, of big size that actually has the entire team, sometimes even ethics team. So they do have a profession to help them with this. And it's very different with the uh, organizations on the grassroots level that are just uh, like people like most of us in the room that are just starting this work as peace builders, working in a very small team on the data science project, how do they actually now start uh, applying some of these things? Uh, most of them, Andrea, like majority of data scientists just ask, okay, GDPR, I know this is my, like, I need to follow this. This is where the conversation ends. Um, and it's very difficult as well to put now this burden on them of reading these hundreds and hundreds of pages and figuring out on their own uh, what to do, which then I agree, we need a new profession as well to help bring those principles to practice. Would one of you like to take the question? I think that the history one is actually, I mean, Evelyn already mentioned some of the work on the human rights that is directly coming from history. I think, unfortunately, so much of the work on ethics comes after the harm has already been done. So most of the work is actually just looking into, okay, we already did it wrong. How can we now make it right and, and adopt the principles and practices to, I, to do I that? Can, yeah, I can an anchor this to something more contemporary. So like all the past global trade I mentioned, uh, we can kind of think about global trade of data that we can argue 
there are increasingly kind of people feeling uneasy about that global trade of data analytics, like, you know, business intelligence, right? You can still argue that, you know, it's still okay, anonymized or whatever, but I think it's hard to ignore that there are some people starting to feel this trade is, well, at least not comfortable with it, right? So, so how can we kind of apply this? I, I think it's very relevant. You know? That's where the processes come in, right? So what is the process for actually then, you know, understanding how you go about you know, the, uh, the approach? Uh, because like, for instance, in the, uh, in the technology and the data space, which I, I didn't hear a lot yesterday as well, is that how do you actually get the social license for using all of this, right? Uh, and that needs to be quite often uh, localized, right? Because it depends on where you apply it. And that requires some kind of a, a process. And I think the interesting thing, about today is that there is a lot more experimentation in uh, process development, right? So there's a lot of process innovation that I think we need to apply to this ethical space on how do you actually engage with citizens and how do you go about uh, uh, getting different input, culturally sensitive and inclusive kind of input in uh, how you go about, uh, for instance, determining what is fit for purpose within that locality, right? And I think that's where I think there's a lot of opportunity for innovation. And that's also, Andrea, you've done a lot of work on that as well. But I think we need to merge, we need to, the work on data and ethics needs to be connected with the work on direct democracy and all the other, and it, because it, it actually does align uh, more and more uh, together from my point of view. Quickly uh, add to this that um, obviously when you talk about ethical frameworks for uh, uh, responsible AI development, uh, you are talking about social technical systems, right? So you are nested into the, what is perceived as being ethical or unethical in the specific social context. And so it is, it is part of that work to try and adapt the process to the uh, local needs and, uh, and what is perceived as ethical or unethical at the local level. Um, Part of this is embedding diversity or using local um, voices in the uh, definition, in a design phase of AI, which could also incorporate talking to external stakeholders. This also uh, um, uh, contemplates in the development and the deployment of AI system, the use of data that are representative of the local population to avoid imposing other realities on the modeling of reality that AI needs in order to, uh, to uh, uh, act in a specific context and so on and so forth. Um, so if something is not officially recognized or, or the, the wind doesn't really change on, on the perception of something that could be considered as unfair at the global level, it's unlikely that AI actually captures that. Um, and the more you use machine learning that is actually dependent on past data and where data is available actually, uh, so not necessarily on all the data that you might want, the more you are, you know, the less you are likely to capture potential evolution in, uh, in, the, in the global or even a local uh, sentiment of perception of what is uh, now considered as ethical or unethical, so changes in perceptions. Uh, so you need to proactively intervene there and so make that an element of um, developers or deployers responsibility to try and avoid creating um, uh, harm uh, even if that harm is not officially legally recognized as harm, right? And it's a, it's a, um, a difficult thing to do, uh, but this is why I was mentioning, you know, that's something that is law, uh, compliance with the law and there's something else that is in the post-compliance ethics space. How far do we push that? It's not absolutely not easy to, to imagine at this stage. It depends very much on the standards that are agreed upon uh, on the, at the international level to push this beyond existing legislation, but it's also unlikely to rely on frameworks like UNESCO, which come with absolutely no enforcement uh, or implementation principles, uh, despite the fact that they are uh, interesting and, uh, and uh, impossible to disagree with, right? So um, the most important part there also for the peace building, uh, I like the Stefan's uh, reference to, and this is something that we, we discussed also in the high level expert group, uh, can and will there be cases in which not using AI or not sharing data, not making use of data can be considered to be unethical? Uh, and that is uh, a trade-off that is not fully reflected at the moment in the existing frameworks. So but that could be 
this level of proactivity, making it part of responsible business conduct, for example, it is something that could uh, potentially happen from the OECD level um, onwards. And finally, as a footnote, the most famous case in which not acting was considered to be officially considered to be unethical is the Rohingya case that you mentioned with Facebook, because indeed it is the fact that Facebook has had the possibility to observe this content shaping up and the hate speech shaping up and didn't do anything about it that ended up creating a, a problem and uh, ended up with Facebook settling uh, in court, right? So that is um, uh, uh, perhaps an area that is worth developing further. Yeah. Well, yes, please, Evelyn, do. Uh, and and we, I will just, I don't know if Christian can hear me from Search for Common Ground, if he wants to type his question into chat. I, I did invite him to yes, ask you. Yes. But, can you hear me? Oh, we can hear you, yes. All right. Thank you very much uh, for this wonderful panel and the great, great inputs from all of the panelists and the presenters. I guess my question is really also an observation that I think would be interesting to also hear some input from uh, panelists is that I've noticed in the ethical uh, space for AI that uh, a lot of conversation is happening in silos. And it seems to me that we need to bridge the gap between those who are working, for example, on AI in the spaces, for example, of the military, because they should also be thinking about ethics. But to a large extent, it seems to me that the conversation is kind of fragmented or fragmentary whereby we see in the peace building space, actors such as us working on these issues and trying to you know, raise you know, questions that we think need to be paid attention to when developing ethics. So my question rather is simply, what would it take to bridge this gap with the military space or with other spaces where ethics for peace is needed to, to be discussed more, more jointly? Because otherwise I think we may not be achieve a lot of impact if it continues to happen only in silos in the long trajectory. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. The, this question of military and, and ethics and peace keeps coming back. Um, I'll give the floor back to Evelyn. Uh, you can refer to this question or, or, or others, but quickly, I'm aware we are uh, over the time and people are waiting okay. probably for Thank the next session much, to Franca. start. Thank you, Evelyn. Um, I'm going to try to make it short and maybe it summarizes a bit also what we discussed. Like if we have a look at these three main strands of ethics that also um, you mentioned, like the virtue ethics, the ontological and the consequentialism. Um, I think really, ideally, we would make them try to fit together in a harmonious picture, like not competing with each other as they often do, but um, ideally, um, like designing AI with good intentions, making sure that, for example, human rights already respected norms are respected, um, and also taking into account what might be the, the consequences of all our good intentions and norm following are the consequences fitting with that. And for that, I think it's uh, important also to go back to the concept of uh, practical wisdom, which basically connects practice and theory. And that's also what I think we aim to do at the Global Peace Tech Hub, to connect both um, really practical case studies with um, more kind of abstract or theoretical discussions, but both are needed, I believe. And um, Yes, of course, like uh, things change during during time, what uh, Nikita said, and um, I think we might have to be careful if um, from a from an ethics point of view, not to fall into the trap that what is um, regarded as ethic moral today will also be moral tomorrow. I mean, ethics is a continuous process, as was also noted, it's not an end point, it's about asking the right questions, not all about finding like the right results. And even if we are lucky in moral terms, moral norms turn into legal norms, that's also not written in stone. Like it's a, it's a continuous process and um, it's also a political process, but we really have to reflect upon that. I think so. Um, yes, ideally it goes hand in hand, the virtue, what the, our intentions, our, um, the norms that we follow and the consequences thereof. And if we get it right, it hopefully does. But we have to prepare it also for a continuous um, evaluation thereof, I think. And that's maybe also the role of academia to kind of connect these two worlds. So yes, thank you very much, Frank. I hope that it was short enough. <laughs> thank you. To quickly ask Lucia, do we still have time to, we have two more questions or we need to, just for us.
There's one group missing. There's one group missing. So you have time for I'll, Then I'll take some time to, but also you refer to, question, take two questions or well, one. Elizabeth, Elizabeth. Yeah, no, I actually wanted to build a little bit under our own, and I'm just really interested to hear from the panel about um, this concept of not doing. Um, because I think that's really interesting. I remember it being discussed um, at the expert group and it somehow got lost along the way. And I think uh, the operational cost of not doing something uh, and the impact it has is, is potentially really significant. But I don't know, I'm really interested to know if you've been thinking about how you actually make that happen, how you operationalize it, how you put the language in to do that, because I think we need to think about, it's kind of going to also what the lady here was saying um, about, the, it helps you with the future if you can think about the cost of not doing as well as the cost of doing. Um, but it kind of gets, it got lost in the EU debate and it would be nice to bring it back in and try to do something with it, if not at EU level, you know, at least in discourse so that we can start to have some movement around that. Thank you. Just ask a, a, a clarification. You mean the cost of not doing if we put too much of the ethical constraints in place, so we actually can't even develop or design or deploy some of the technologies? Is this the cost? No, the opportunity cost. The opportunity yeah, cost. The opportunity okay. cost if you don't do anything. So, yeah. so I mean, Andrea, your example of Facebook is a, is a, for example, it's one part of it, a very good example of you know, um, and there was in the end a cost to Facebook, right? But it shouldn't have happened. And a lot of these companies, a, a lot of companies have, I mean, we all, you know, think about AI principles and so on and so forth, but they're, they're quite static. And, and actually that is a more proactive way of thinking about it, but it's actually hard to operationalize it. Maybe I'll say something super quickly. On this, we can continue. <laughs> um, if you if you start from the, from our view of capitalism, the one that is do dominating our society today, which is shareholder capitalism, the incentive of a company is uh, of a corporation is that of maximizing value for shareholders. So you don't no normally under those frameworks impose any proactive obligation to help wherever it is possible to help, right? Um, Obviously, that view is being surpassed. I mean, even uh, Joe Biden said we need to bury shareholder capitalism. The view of stakeholder capitalism is a little bit more oriented towards trying to pursue the common good while at the same time pursuing profit. But uh, that too is very limited, meaning it more oriented towards the immediate group of stakeholders that operate around the specific enterprise. So there is no real uh, framework for proactive behavior. That said, um, whether as part uh, today of corporate social responsibility first, uh, or responsible business conduct, you can single out cases in which it is obvious in your operations that there are things that you could have done uh, to avoid massive damage, massive harm by using AI or data, or if there are areas where you might want to share data to help in an outstanding emergency situation, uh, that is uh, something that could potentially still be incorporated in an overall uh, sort of due diligence and due diligence uh, requirement for, uh, for a corporation. I'm uh, even more concerned when it comes to using cost-benefit analysis, right? You mentioned that before. Uh, when you talk about human rights and, uh, and in particular absolute human rights, but also human rights in general, in, the, the cost-benefit analysis, uh, analysis framework is uh, ill-suited for taking decisions and unpacking trade-offs. Because in most cases, what you do, it actually forces you to, to monetize human life, the value of a statistical life. And uh, this is so arbitrary and uh, so much related to market behavior that it has nothing to do with how one should take decisions in that, uh, in that respect. So I think the world of, uh, let's say, decision, rational decision making and uh, proactive decision making for the common good still has to depart a little bit from that framework and perhaps adopt I'll say this uh, shortly and happy to elaborate, I don't know, over dinner, um, a more Rawlsian framework, if you wish, where certain things are priorities, so 
sort of lexicographic ordering. I don't want to say bad words, but uh, uh, and uh, no decision can be considered to be an improvement if it doesn't improve on those specific angles and priorities that you have set, typically human rights. Uh, just a quick final answer. This is for you. Why is the military uh, left out of the AI Act? The AI Act is only on civilian applications. Mm -hmm. uh, it turned out outside of the competences of the DGs that were working on this, and um, uh, and also subject to a much more heated debate that required a completely different set of, uh, of stakeholders and a completely different set of um, uh, ethical principles, because the ethical principles that apply that are borrowed from sort of ethics of research or bioethics that are incorporated in the AI Act, which do not include things like beneficence, for example, that would go in this pro proactive way. They don't, uh, but are different from the ethics of warfare, right? And, uh, and uh, certainly the intention to save lives and the priorities that you should give to protection of human rights doesn't apply uh, whenever you are programming a system to go and execute or optimize a task. Then obviously on laws or so lethal autonomous weapons, we can talk until tomorrow, but that's, that's another, a different That's frame. another session, another conference to talk about, to talk about laws. Um, we don't have time. I really wanted to give you uh, time for some conclusions and wrap up and maybe to put us on a positive note, but I will leave it for the next session because I know we, we will have a sort of a debrief. Um, so uh, with this, I will actually close now and, and again say this was the place to ask questions and raise many of them and I think we succeeded. Uh, this is the point of AI ethics as well, not to have all of the answers ready, but to know actually what are the questions to ask. So thank you everybody for joining us. Thanks so much for my panelists for presenting this amazing, to amazing thank work. Uh, and let's take some break and then uh, we'll have some time to, we have to let the people in, yes. <laughs>